Hello and welcome to the Outsider Art Podcast, episode 18, Susan Takaharingi King. I'm not sure about you, dear listeners, but I'm often struck with a sense of irrational personal pride whenever I hear about a compatriot achieving greatness. Whether it be on the sports field, in arts or literature, in science, environmentalism, entertainment or almost any other field you'd care to name. In New Zealand, a country with a tiny population, there is a notion that any individual is just a couple of degrees of separation from anyone else. This feeling of interconnectedness, like you'd have in any small town anywhere, seems to allow for a collective ownership of New Zealanders and their accomplishments. We confidently and without embarrassment claim director Peter Jackson, musician Lord, Booker Prize winner Kerry Hume, and the All Blacks rugby team as our own. Their triumphs become our triumphs. This sometimes turns into a faux nationalism that is bizarrely hubristic, but it also reinforces what we have in common as New Zealanders, more often than not in a positive way. I've been thinking about this in relation to the subject of this episode, Susan Takaharangi King, and my sense of irrational personal pride in her astounding artistic achievements. Susan, like me, is a New Zealander, and although she is from the generation prior to mine, she has lived much of her life in the same New Zealand, in inverted commas, as me, immersed in the same popular culture and social mores. She has even spent most of her adult life just a few kilometres away from my family home on Auckland's North Shore. The characters from Disney and Looney Tunes and the pop culture ephemera that populates much of her work were ubiquitous in my childhood and are familiar and evocative, much like the Kiwiana hidden with subtlety throughout her drawings waiting for eagle eyes to pick them out. There is a glorious nostalgia in Susan's drawings, but is by no means sentimental or twee, in fact, Due to the twisted, roiling, intriguingly bizarre abstraction of her work, it becomes a far more authentic nostalgia. Her work appeals to me because it reinforces and clarifies a common cultural history through granting access to an entirely original visual perspective on that history. I'm flushed with undeserved pride about that. You may have noticed that I'm referring to Susan by her first name instead of the traditional approach of using her surname King. I'm going to continue to do that throughout this episode because Susan's story as a fellow New Zealander feels more personal and connected to me. It also feels like a genuinely New Zealand way to refer to her. So, quite obviously, I'm a fan of Susan's work and I'm in an ever-increasing long queue of admirers. Since the late 2000s, when her work first turned up on a Facebook page curated by her family, Susan's star has risen as recognition and appreciation of her talent and her unique vision has spread throughout the art world. And the exciting thing about Susan is that her place in that art world is still to be fully defined and her significance fully appraised. Alex Gartenfeld, in his foreword to the drawings of Susan Takaharangi King, the monograph that accompanied the Institute of Contemporary Art Miami's 2016 exhibition, offers some thoughts on the potential of Susan's importance. Quote, For mere historical record, King's interpretations of Donald Duck, in which she animates, inverts and explodes the beloved Disney character, predates the transgression of fine art with comic book imagery by canonical pop artists. While King's work could not be said to unwind the dialectics of high and low culture, it evidences a working method that is radically open-ended, that of a young woman who early on responded to the formal, psychological and allegorical realms of mass media during the mid to late 20th century. Take a look at a single one of her Donald Duck drawings from the late 1950s. The figure crushed and exasperated under the psychedelic weight of data, 
and decades of pop culture and reactive artistic productions are summoned to mind. End quote. In the late 1950s, Susan would have been younger than 10 years old. Yet her artistic interpretations of popular culture, and comic book characters in particular, reveal a rare and sophisticated visual acuity that wasn't intellectualized, but innate. In Susan, we find the double gem of a startlingly singular mind and the raw ability to translate the contents of this mind onto paper. Viewing Susan's work is an exercise in close observation and careful analysis, something that may seem counterintuitive given the commonness of the subject matter and the repetition. Robert Leonard, in his article for Vault magazine entitled Susan King, Address Unknown, comments, quote, Looking at her works demands shifting levels of attention as we scan them to register the pattern, then again to excavate embedded images. End quote. Without allowing yourself the time to look, Susan's drawings seem like an impenetrable mass of figures and abstractions, but they are loaded with allegory, interpretation, and what seems to me like an intention to express complex and intense feelings, reactions, and emotions. They are, I believe, a doorway into Susan's mind, and a map to understanding how those with autism view and perceive the world around them. I read a quote recently from photographer Francesca Woodman, her final journal entry before her passing. Quote, I was inventing a language for people to see the everyday things that I also see and show them something different. End quote. How Susan sees everyday things is almost unknowable, but perhaps she has also found a way to convey her perception of these everyday things so that we too see them in a different way. Her work seems entirely uncensored and boldly unbothered with meeting any of society's or art's rules. There is a pureness to them that is remarkable and enlightening. Susan Takaharingi King was born in 1951 in Te Araha, a small rural town in New Zealand's North Island, the second eldest in a family of 12 children. Her parents, Doug and Dawn, met while attending the first Māori language school in New Zealand. Their shared and lifelong passion for Māori language and culture unusual for non-Māori at the time. Many of their children were given Māori names. Te Kaharangi, which was gifted to Susan, means the treasured one. It seems fitting. Susan began drawing at a young age and early on showed a preternatural ability in her illustration of figures, a fact that was recognised by her teacher in the first year of school in 1956 when she was five years old. Inasmuch as her talents were evident, so too was her loss of speech which had begun to diminish around 1954, and her learning and behavioural difficulties. Upon her teacher's recommendation, Susan was sent to Auckland, New Zealand's largest city, to undergo medical evaluations. She stayed there with her grandparents Myrtle and William Murphy throughout the remainder of 1956. Susan had stayed with her grandparents previously in 1955, and it was during this time that her grandmother began documenting Susan's development in her diary. Myrtle's writings, her letters, diaries, journals and notes, are an astonishing and comprehensive record of Susan's growth as an artist and as a person. They record, over several decades, both a committed dedication to trying to understand her granddaughter's unique needs and an instinctive appreciation of and confidence in Susan's remarkable art. One of Myrtle's letters from 1955, which was exhibited at Intuit in 2019, provides a clear example of just how advanced Susan was at age four. Quote, she drew a most lovely thing like this, as good as a 10 or 12 year old could do. It's uncanny her cleverness for art. I'm sure she'll make a living of it, at least we'll get to the top. Just out of her head, and as quick as anything, 
even nicer than mine, and a thing like a poppy. Hers is more like it than mine, as hers comes from her heart. I'd love to show it to an expert in the line of art, and see what he would say. End quote. At the beginning of 1957, after Susan had come home to Te Araha, she was unable to return to the local primary school due to their unwillingness to accommodate her. So the few months she had spent at Te Araha Primary in 1956 was all Susan ever had in a mainstream school. In August 1958, she was accepted into a special school for intellectually handicapped children. Located in Hamilton, she was enrolled as a boarder as it was too far to travel each day. She returned home in the school holidays. It was during her first term of attending the Christopher House that Susan ceased speaking altogether. Unfortunately, she was not allowed to draw at the hostel as they feared the younger children may take her crayons and draw on the newly painted walls. Similarly, later in her life, during a stay at a mental health unit in Auckland Hospital in 1965, when she was in for observation, once again her art supplies were removed. This time the reasoning behind being deprived of her drawing materials was the medical professional's experiment to see if out of desperation she may be compelled to talk. Almost 40% of autistic people are non-verbal. However, in 1960s New Zealand, autism wasn't well understood, and it wouldn't be until the 2010s that Susan was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. In August 1960, Susan began attending Kingswood, a centre for intellectually handicapped children. The family had shifted from Te Araha to Auckland's North Shore, especially so Susan could attend the newly established school, which was right beside a mainstream school where her brothers and sisters would go. Being so close, she was able to attend daily, so thankfully her boarding school days were over. While Kingswood's program was somewhat varied, with plenty of room to develop and express creative flair in their earlier years, in 1970 Susan, now a young adult, transitioned to the Opportunity Workshop Division and was now engaged in a production-driven program, which offered little, if any, opportunity for her to pursue her real talents and interests. As her sister, Petita Cole, explains in an interview in the drawings of Susan Takaharangi King, quote, In the early 1970s, at a time when she was reported to be doing very well with her rug-making at Kingswood, it was also noted that she had become despondent and not drawing much. End quote. Susan could certainly make the rugs to a high standard, but it was likely that this was more out of a combination of faithfully complying with her instructor's expectations and a compulsion for completing the job once begun. She developed an allergy to the wool and suffered from itchy eyes and sneezing which would have compounded the lack of satisfaction of being compelled to follow a predetermined pattern with pre-selected colours over and over again. It would seem that the government dictated mandate for older attendees of intellectually handicapped institutions in New Zealand in the later half of the 20th century was on encouraging them to engage in, quote, productive work. In the years that followed, a range of these productive work tasks were introduced at Kingswood that were mostly menial, repetitive and uninspiring. While they may possibly have been enjoyed by some, this was not the case with Susan, as Cole explains. Quote, it is possibly due to the repetitive nature of this work that she became increasingly obsessed with repetitive and compulsive behaviours at home, like shutting windows straightening things, pulling loose threads, or feeling compelled to rip any paper that is creased. She was becoming more and more consumed by things that annoyed or upset her. This heightened sensitivity she was experiencing made her anxious and on edge, and she was certainly not in a good frame of mind for drawing. End quote. An oft-repeated factoid in the story of Susan is that she stopped drawing for 20 years. 
From what I can gather, it would seem that she actually stopped drawing for around 15 years, from 1992 or 93 through until 2008. But whether it was 15 or 20 years, this must have been a confusing and troubling time for both Susan and her family. What is often not mentioned is why she stopped drawing. Petita Cole comments on this in the interview mentioned previously. Quote, During the 1980s through the early 1990s, Susan was evidently in a low state, not only psychologically but also physically, as she was experiencing the recurrence of irritable symptoms that caused discomfort for some time. Also, with many of her siblings having left home, she was quite possibly feeling a bit left out or low emotionally. There was a fair bit of fluctuation with her slipping in and out of drawing phases during this time, with some quite lengthy periods of abstinence. End quote. The stable base from which Susan had been at her most productive may have felt like it was gradually eroding. The 1980s were a time of rapid cultural and societal reshaping, and as her siblings left home and the family unit naturally altered, these changes could very well have seemed momentous to her. Without wanting to sound all art wanky, but knowing it will, it's almost like as the world around her, both on the micro and macro levels, changed, over time Susan lost her muse. Her sister Petita recalled that during this time Susan would often just sit around doing nothing, unmotivated without her drawing. It was a sustained hiatus of many long, slow years. Throughout her life, Susan's family had been both supportive and encouraging of her talent. Her grandmother went to great lengths in her efforts to extend Susan's audience with the hope of raising her profile, showing her work not only to friends and family who showed an interest, but also to influential people in the community, like doctors, post office workers and librarians. Her hope was that, by spreading awareness of Susan and her art, further opportunities for her as an artist could eventuate or maybe even lead to the family finding answers and help in better understanding and meeting her special needs. Over the years, whatever artwork Susan created at home was kept, some more carefully than others, depending on the circumstances. Drawings were stacked in piles, others stored in cupboards, boxes, cases or rolls. When she stayed at her grandparents, some of Susan's work had been scrapbooked by her grandmother and included dates and notes, often giving context to the work that would prove vital in later years. Drawings made at the Kingswood Centre, which she attended for almost three decades, really made their way home. Her mother Dawn recalled that these drawings, ones the family had never seen, were often given away or kept by staff. Who knows, some of those early acquisitions may possibly still be out there, maybe treasured, maybe not perhaps stuffed in a bottom drawer or pressed in the pages of an old book. In 2005, Susan's sister, Petita, embarked on a self-directed project, the mammoth task of unearthing, cataloguing and promoting Susan's drawings that had been stored in the family home for decades. Finally, Susan's art was available to a global audience, and the slow burn of well-deserved recognition began. The first major spark came in the form of the filming of Pictures of Susan by documentary maker Dan Salmon. Although the documentary was released in 2012, filming began in 2008 and was rewarded with probably the best possible hook the filmmaker and family could have hoped for. Susan had begun drawing again. Her first exhibition a 2009 solo show at the Callan Park Gallery at the University of Sydney in Australia features in the documentary, along with wonderful footage of Susan absorbing the attention and recognition of her work. Interestingly, this wasn't the first time Susan's work had been exhibited. In a post on Petita Cole's Instagram account, 
at the Petita Cole Collection, which is a fascinating deep dive into a collection of memorabilia and items that reveal intriguing details about Susan's life and work, Petita featured a letter from the Intellectually Handicapped Society for Children, IHC, addressed to Susan's parents in 1973. It disclosed to the family for the first time that several of Susan's paintings and drawings had been sent to London as entries for an international competition organised by the National Society for Mentally Handicapped Children, the English equivalent of the IHC. The letter informs that two of Susan's entries were exhibited and consequently sold to the general public, collectively fetching three pounds. The family was unaware of any of this until they received this letter regarding the competition and accompanied by the £3 payment. It reminds me of a similar situation with Bill Trailer's work when, in the 1940s, his supporter Charles Shannon sent back a cheque from MoMA for the purchase of some pieces of trailers, as MoMA hadn't bothered consulting him about a price for the works. But at least Trailer was able to retain his work whereas Susan's family have no idea what the paintings that sold look like or what happened to the several drawings and paintings that were sent as entries but not exhibited. Since the Callan Park exhibition in 2009, Susan's work has been included in many solo and group exhibits at galleries, art fairs and museums, both in New Zealand and internationally. Artist Gary Panter who has described her work as bringing, quote, glimpses of another dimension that resides within all of us, as a supporter, as is artist and designer Brian Donnelly, better known as Cause. In a recent interview with Valerie Rousseau, senior curator at the American Folk Art Museum, he commented that Susan's early work would, quote, live so perfectly, end quote, with the work of one of the leading figures within pop art, Peter Saul as well as going on to say, quote, I think her new work is just as fascinating, end quote. Susan's work is held in a number of highly regarded private and public collections, including MoMA, the American Folk Art Museum, the ICA Miami, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Auckland Art Gallery, Toy Otamaki, amongst others. Susan is currently represented by the Andrew Edlin Gallery in New York and the Robert Held Gallery in Wellington, New Zealand. I'm going to finish this episode here, but there will be a part two in which I look in more depth at Susan's art, her themes, her influences, her techniques, and the way she incorporates popular culture into her work. Fortuitously, I've had the opportunity to spend some time with Susan's work thanks to her sister Petita, who is responsible for managing the massive undertaking that is Susan's archive, and who I will interview for an upcoming episode. I've already spent a fascinating few hours with Petita looking through the archive, and I hope over the next few weeks to be able to take the opportunity to really delve into the work, because I think that this is the only way to really be able to appreciate Susan's talent and genius. So I'll report back in the next episode. Many thanks to Petita for her willingness and generosity in sharing Susan's archive, her assistance with the writing of this episode, and helping me out by lending me a copy of The Drawings of Susan Te Kaharangi King, which is out of print and quite hard to get hold of. So please tune in again for the next episode on Susan Te Kaharangi King, to be followed by an interview with Petita Cole. As usual, I'll put a reading list on the podcast website at shows.acast.com slash outsider-art-podcast. I'll also put Instagram links up for the Petita Cole Collection and Susan Takaharangi King pages. They are well worth checking out. Please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review the podcast. And thanks very much to Lyman Wren from the US for the lovely review on Apple Podcasts. Catch you next time on the Outsider Art Podcast, and thanks so much for listening.